Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Zuborski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And I'm joined today by Petra. Petra, can you please introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you do? Sure. Uh, so um, my name is Petra Smith, and I work for the Allen Institute in Seattle, Washington. We are a biomedical research organization of about 900 people, and I have the honor of leading our people and culture team, which is comprised mm -hmm. of our learning, experience, and development team, core human resource functions, and our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belongings team. Perfect. Thank you. And can you share a little bit about what is actually the approach to flexible work at the Allen Institute? Uh, at the Allen Institute, our approach to flexible work is really um, hyper flexible is the way that we refer mm -hmm. to it. Uh, as we returned from the pandemic and we had about half of our team working fully remote, we had some mm -hmm. decisions to make about um, mm -hmm. what our requirements would be to come back into the office. And we determined pretty early on uh, that we were going to leave decisions about the level of flexibility up to individual teams and leaders mm -hmm. uh, to meet their business needs, and that we were not going to institute uh, a mandated in-office uh, amount of time, but really let the business needs drive um, mm -hmm. uh, how things were organized team by team. So what did you see as the benefits of this approach? Why is that something that you chose? Uh, for us, some of the benefits of a hyper-flexible approach are uh, instead of having a one-size-fits-all for all 900 folks in the organization, mm -hmm. it really allows uh, individual team members and leaders to design what works best, not only for the, the work that needs to be done, but for the individuals on the team. Uh, some of the positive impacts of that, I think, are um, greater buy-in from team members mm -hmm. uh, provides flexibility for individuals to meet the needs that they have outside of the workplace. Uh, and I think that in, uh, engenders more engagement, uh, leads to uh, longer retention, less turnover, mm -hmm. happier, happier team members, which I think results in better work and accelerates our mission. Excellent. Now, I worked with the Information Science Institute, which is a 300-ish people research institute at the University of Southern California, and it also adopted, we worked on the same idea, we adopted a pretty hyper-flexible model, but they did have some challenges with things like collaboration, onboarding of new staff, mentoring, definitely worked on a full-fledged mentoring program that was a major issue. So, and that's a research institute in many ways similar to the Allen Institute in this form of teams, researchers, and people who work for them. I'm sure you have probably some graduate students or something like that. Tell me a little bit more about what kind of challenges you experienced. I'm curious if there will be some parallels to what I saw in my work consulting for the Information Science Institute. Sure. So the Allen Institute, so we're, as I said, we're about 900 people. About mm -hmm. half of our team um, work in our labs. And so mm -hmm. their work demands that they be on site for the majority yep. of it. And so even through COVID, about half of our team was on site um, mm -hmm. most of the time. And then the other half was working fully remote and then is now returned in a hybrid fashion um, the, it, with what works at the team level. Uh, so some of the challenges that we've faced are uh, making sure that the expectations for individual employees and the man managers and leaders and the needs of the business are aligned. Mm -hmm. um, we've certainly had some situations where employees have wanted to work fully remote um, and that hasn't been conducive to the collaboration you were referencing and uh -huh. team building. And so um, uh, using my team as an example, my people mm -hmm. and culture team uh, is made up of 32 people and uh, we have one in office day a month. Um, we do an all staff okay. meeting on that day and we build other in-person collaborative activities to happen on that same day so that people don't mm -hmm. feel like they're coming in just for a two hour meeting when the rest of their work could be done fully remotely. Um, so that's what happens on my team across the mm -hmm. institutes, um, meeting some of the challenges of making sure that we have opportunities to build collaboration, um, creating opportunities for that serendipitous interaction with folks that really mm -hmm. breathe a lot of creativity and innovation is um, we do a lot at the Allen Institute to incentivize people to want to be on site. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's the, the baseline of what does the business require? And then mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot to make the community really uh, engaging and interactive and, make, and incentivize people to want to be there. 
some of the things that we do, uh, we have a seminar series called the Allen Hour. Uh, it happens um, every other week, and oftentimes it uh, after that learning opportunity, there's um, a social hour. People get to engage, ask questions. Uh, last week, as an example, we had our postdocs and um, there are postdocs and some of our interns doing uh, their poster series, and so it was an opportunity for them to showcase the work that they've been doing over the last really the last year for our postdocs um, and engage with folks uh, in that way. Um, we we also provide fruit on Mondays, Monday fruit. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes a little bit of healthy food midday. Sure. And so lots of different things to to draw people in and, and build community. Um, the other place that we build a lot of community is we have uh, six affinity groups and mm -hmm. they are very active in opportunities for for learning, learning about cultures, engaging together. Mm -hmm. Again, different strategies to just uh, help make the workplace and the, the work site a place where people want to be. And that's been pretty effective for us. Excellent. Yeah, it reminds me of some stuff that the Information Sciences Institute was doing. What we arranged there was to have breakfast activities on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then Thursday to have like a lunch meeting and also a breakfast meeting for senior leaders. And so people know that that's kind of functioned as a social anchor. And this is in addition to the academic events and social hours after that. We also have some things like yoga groups and so on that people come together and have social activities. So the socializing is really valuable to bring people in. And so that really echoes what I would recall them doing. Now, another thing what we recall for the consultant. Now, another thing that I found and what we found was a challenge is that different managers had different levels of skill in approaching hybrid work. It's often the case that academics don't really get training at how to be managers. So even that they lack good training, that they become managers because they get grants and they have money and they manage teams, but they don't necessarily get training how to be managers. It's especially the case that I mean, no managers got training in hybrid work before the pandemic overwhelmingly. And so we had to do a lot of training to help managers learn what are the best practices of actually managing their teams, communicating, coordinating, innovating. There are lots of techniques to do so in remote and flexible settings and hybrid settings. But many people didn't really figure those things out until they were taught to do that, to share some best practices across the organization. So I'm curious what you're doing to help managers, meaning the real PIs who are leading teams, the uh, uh, principal investigators, for those folks who don't know in terms of the audience who are listening, what you do to help them manage their teams effectively in this hyper-flexible setting. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, even before COVID, we, we've we had um, a learning series for new managers and new leaders, mm. so whether somebody's been promoted internally or come from the outside. Um, we've got um, a, a curriculum for them to support them in their leadership roles. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we were returning from COVID, um, to to your point, it's a, it's a great call out. Uh, we, we built some resources for, for leaders to understand and think about um, what they should be how they should be approaching hybrid work, um, making decisions about what are the minimum requirements for their teams, how to have those conversations with individuals when there might be a, um, a lack of alignment between what mm -hmm. the leader is seeking and what individuals are seeking, uh, how, to, how to manage performance, productivity, um, individual needs that are different when somebody is in the office sometimes and working remotely sometimes. Um, the tools that we've put together are some guidelines, some workflows, mm -hmm. um, some questions and prompts uh, that are available to leaders to go to. Uh, so when somebody um, moves into a leadership role, uh, that's a that's a time when we make sure they're familiar mm -hmm. with all of those materials. And then our H our human resource business partners are also connecting with leaders regularly. And so our intent is that rather than waiting until there's a challenge or, or a conflict between a leader or an individual or, an, or a team, it's really help leaders be, be ready to, to lead effectively so that it's um, a, a seamless experience for, for everybody involved. Excellent. And the last issue I wanted to touch on in terms of challenge was mentoring and onboarding, like getting new people on the team. As you're getting new people on the team, especially junior people, it's much more difficult to do so in a hyper-flexible environment where they're not meeting people and they're not getting mentoring 
they're not forming those networks naturally that they previously would have done so when they're in person. So something we have to do at the Information Science Institute is to establish a well-fledged, thought out and well fleshed out mentoring program where we match junior researchers with more senior researchers who have been there for a while and have both from their own department and from other departments from their own department to get them into the culture subculture of their department from other departments to help them learn about the organization more broadly the career track and so on and so i'm curious what you are doing in that field how and this is separately from onboarding we have to do of course onboarding as well but mentoring that after that first few weeks that that proved to be very valuable i'm curious what you're doing for these new folks that you're bringing on, especially in the research field, who need that mentoring and sponsorship that is harder to get in a hyper-flexible environment. Yeah, um, so for our new employees, we we do have an on-site uh, first day that occurs, and then we have uh, at about the one month mark, each month we have uh, a new employee orientation or a learning and connection week is what we refer to it as. And so anybody who started in the last month last month participates in that, and um, significant portions of that are uh, in person, are, are in the building. And so it, um, we help to create a cohort for our new employees. And then part mm -hmm. of the tools and support that we provide for leaders um, is around specifically having new team members come on. How, mm -hmm. how are you going to help as a leader? How are you going to help them, uh, those new employees, get in, uh, connected and engaged and build those, those networks that you were referring to? Uh, so some teams, as an example, have an expectation that new employees are working on site for uh, a certain period of time at the mm -hmm. beginning of employment to build to naturally more naturally build some of those connections. Uh, and it varies from team to team, depending on what the work is. Uh, uh, and so we leave that again at the leader level for mm -hmm. individual teams, uh, but we provide some structure and some guidance to help them in prompting the thinking about that. So instead of it just happening, they're being really intentional about it. Um, with regard to mentoring, we do not have a formal mentoring program other than our summer internship program and postback mm -hmm. programs at the moment. That's that's on our list to build out um, a more mm -hmm. robust mentoring opportunity. Um, but I, I I see with our interns and our postbacks, our postbacks stay for one to two years, depending mm -hmm. um, on what their projects are. Our interns come for the summer. We'll have our first a uh, cohort coming in two weeks. I'm um, excited we've got an intern coming nice. to join our team for, for 10 weeks. And so summer interns come for, for 10 weeks um, and it's a very curated curated experience. And so uh, they're doing a lot of their, their work on site. They are connected with a mentor. They're part of a cohort mm -hmm. group. And we'd like to replicate that um, more broadly uh, across our organization. Although I will point out that the other place that we are really starting to create some cohorts, they're not formal mentors, but it's really bringing community together, uh, is we have a lot of individuals that come join the Allen Institute from different parts of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So they may be new to working in the United States, maybe new to working on the West Coast, maybe new to working in Seattle, certainly are new to working at the Allen Institute. Um, many of them come and are under visa, visa sponsorship. And so we've created a sure. cohort of those folks. Um, it's a voluntary participation, but um, mm -hmm. brings together folks that bring experiences from different parts of the world into the Allen uh, in a way to build a community. Um, so there's some informal mentoring that happens there. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. That has been very helpful. As we wrap up, what do you see as the future of hyper-flexible work at the Allen Institute? Uh, at the Allen Institute in particular, I think that, um, I think and I hope that we'll remain hyper-flexible. Uh, our CEO and I, I feel like we're very aligned that we really like the approach of um, making the workplace in the physical space a place where people want to come versus getting to any kind of mandate. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think that as we become more skilled in that leadership part, how to, the dynamics of leading um, hybrid and remote teams, um, that it w we will just continue in the way that we have. It will be a part of the, the culture and the fabric of the Allen Institute. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise. That was very helpful. Sure. Happy to. Nice talking with you. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show.